Roberto Lenzagarena. I'm uh, in the Department of Religion uh, as well as the Department of American Studies and Ethnicity here at USC. Uh, and today I'll be moderating this panel, uh, which will be focusing on um, uh, and making use of the category of lived religion in its analysis of uh, televised representations of religion. Uh, lived religion is an approach to the study of religion that's concerned with the intersection of belief and practice in daily life, uh, as opposed to the study of formal, uh, formal religious strictures uh, and rites. This distinction is not an attempt to uh, reinscribe categories of high and low forms of religion, but rather is an attempt to get a better picture of how religion practices function and are linked to specific social contexts. <clears throat> Further, the religion, uh, pardon me, the lived religion approach <laughs> contests the idea that religion is always um, functional and coherent. It assumes that the study of the ambivalent, hybrid, and often contradictory nature of religion um, uh, and its mundane forms provides a unique and perhaps more accurate vantage point on the complex uh, religious lives of practitioners. In sum, uh, scholars of lived religion assume that theology is not simply a matter for theologians, but that theology itself is constituted and reconstituted uh, by practices in churches, shrines, living rooms, streets, uh, and even on the sets of television programs. Uh, uh, so I'd like to very quickly introduce uh, our panelists, and then, um, as each of them goes, I'll give you their, their paper titles. <clears throat> we have uh, Vincent Brook uh, from the Annenberg School of Communication here at USC. Marcia Dawkins, uh, who is also at Annenberg. Um, and uh, Leonard uh, Primiano from Cabrini College in Religious Studies. Uh, and Tom Bodoin, uh, who is at Fordham University. Um, and with that, uh, I turn the microphone over to Vincent Brook, who will be um, uh, giving us his paper, Mixed Blessing. Generational Effects of Interfaith uh, Marriage in Everwood and the Orange OC. Thank you. Thank you. Greetings, shalom, and now synchronize your watches. <laughs> Controversy surrounding interfaith marriage, biblical endorsements notwithstanding, is, a, is as old as Methuselah. For Jews since the diaspora, however, the practices carry special urgency, never more so than in the United States in the postmodern era. With intermarriage rates in the new millennium fast approaching, if not exceeding 50%, and with the Jewish population at 2% of the US total and receding, concern in the Jewish community over outmarriage has reached hysterical proportions. With ch charges of collusion in a silent holocaust, not uncommonly directed at Jews like myself who have deigned to marry outside the faith. It is in this fraught context that two recent American television dramas featuring mixed faith couples, Everwood and The O.C., must be viewed. Everwood centers on the family of the recently widowed neurosurgeon Andy Brown, who is Christian, and whose deceased wife, Julia, was Jewish. Their two children are 15-year-old Ephraim and 8-year-old Dahlia. The OC features the Cohens, Jewish lawyer father Sandy, Presbyterian real estate developer mother Kirsten, and two 16-year-old sons, the biologically related Seth, and the recently adopted Ryan. These popular primetime network shows are not the first TV programs, much less cultural texts, to foreground Jewish-Christian marriage. They are, however, the first primetime series to deal extensively with the intermarriage issue, not merely from the married couples and their respective parents' perspective, but from that of the couple's offspring as well. The significance of this generational shift goes beyond the correspondence to actual trends in the larger society. For what happens to the children of mixed marriages, whether they extend their parents' religious line, attenuate it, or bring it to an abrupt end, is the crux of the intermarriage issue. And indeed, most population surveys lend support to charges that intermarried Jews may be finishing off what Hitler started. Even where ethno-religious identification has taken place, a related problem for Jewish survivalists remains, namely syncretism, or the blending of religions in mixed marriage families. 
The danger here, philosopher Martin Buber warned, is the tendency to lose one's primordial Jewish cultural identity in a syncretistic brew. In the modern day United States, the syncretistic threat has been aggravated, Sylvia Fishman believes, by the American melting pot ethos, generally, and by popular culture specifically, preeminently, television. Quote, American mainstream television indoctrinates viewers to believe, believe that religious syncretism is fair, highly evolved, and truly American. In these intermarriage programs, religious syncretism is not just tolerated, it is a desideratum, unquote. Everwood and the OC, however, tend to challenge Boober's and Fishman's syncretistic and the population survey's statistical concerns regarding intermarriage's generational effects. While religious or even cultural Judaism is certainly not the driving force for the intermarried families in either show, neither Ephraim and Delia Brown in Everwood nor Seth Cohen in the OC exhibit a loss of religious identification as a result of their parents' intermarriage. If anything, their identification, and to a certain extent their expression, is enhanced in the process. Following Hansen's law, in other words, what the parents have wished to forget, the children have chosen to remember. The key to assessing the two shows' intermarriage counter-narrative, I will argue, lies in Robert Orsi's notion of lived religion, which in this august assemblage needs no further explanation. An important catalyst for the alchemical reaction of lived religion and intermarriage in Everwood and the OC are the two shows' eponymous settings. Everwood, Colorado, a Norman Rockwellian village in the Rocky Mountains, is fictional, and Orange County is, of course, an actual place, but both serve mythic purposes. Given that Everwood's main attraction for the Brown family lies in their beloved mother's memory, her own of the place she adored, and her family of her, her families of her, her Jewish spirit hovers over the decidedly Gentile town, whose idyllic rural setting, Sarah Palin, are you listening? <laughs> harbors its share of red state parochialism and skeleton-laden closets. The OC's mythic reinvention of place is more overtly ambivalent. For Newport Beach's outward paradise of blue waters, bronze bodies, and gilded opulence is not only contrasted with a noirish underbelly of corruption, hypocrisy, and deceit, but the postcard picture itself is held up to scorn. Seth captures the cognitive dissonance of his, uh, in his comic book rendering of the town as one in which, quote, demon water polo players emerge from the toxic Pacific and attack Atomic County, unquote. Both the Browns and the Coens, then, are gefilte fish out of water. <laughs> Their geo and demographical otherness grounded in, or at least heightened by, their interfaith status. The two families bring to their new abodes an alien consciousness and an uncommon moral code. Everyday Airwoodians, for example, are intrigued by their Jew York City interlopers and stunned by Dr. Brown's free clinic, although they readily line up for its services. The OCs Sandy and Seth, meanwhile, maintain an uneasy truce with waspish Newport Beach society, expressing disgust at the shallowness and cupidity of their unchosen digs while never rejecting its materialistic comforts. Evaluated on the basis of official religion, Everwood and the OC would have to be given unsatisfactory marks. Attendance at houses of worship is an anomaly in both shows, and professions of faith, with the exception of prepubescent dahlias, are non-existent. Moral, ethical, and spiritual concerns viewed in relation to lived religion, however, tell a different story. Andy Brown's quest for personal and familial redemption in the melding of Julia's bountiful Jewish spirit with Everwood's majestic beauty and small-town Christian values puts transcendence into practice. The transformation is manifested not in church or synagogue going, but in Andy's free clinic, in his selfless dedication to his patients, and in acts of social conscience. In other words, in his devotion to what Neil Gilman calls civil religion. Lived religion for Ephraim, a piano prodigy whose musical development is initially stalled by his mother's death, is channeled largely through culture, a distinctly Jewish form of lived religion, whose religiosity is grounded historically. When Jews in the late 19th century